Hey, well, welcome everyone. Another lovely Saturday. Uh, fun times in Calgary, I bet. The stampede is ongoing. We've seen uh, continued volatility in the markets, maybe more than even some of us expected. And makes my previous comments on volatility in the in the previous sessions maybe maybe uh not that accurate because I thought that was volatile. Now we have this where we're seeing 20, 30, 40% moves in in the equities within a month and and huge spikes and spikes and drops in in WTI on a on a day-to-day -day basis. But you know, wanted to kind of switch it up a bit here today. Um, over the last few kind of two to three months, I've looked at some some junior companies, probably looked at over 50 of them, 50 to 75 of them, uh, basically the entire Canadian market. And um, you know, a lot of them have issues, which is why people are not investing in them. A lot of them are in other jurisdictions, which I don't really look at. There's some Australian, New Zealand, uh, Turkish companies and Kazakhstan and whatnot that I didn't really spend, spend too much time on. Not being familiar with the asset, not having an, an edge in those areas. There were some other ones that came up where there was just not enough information to really make it make an investment decision based on that i was unable to contact management i was unable to kind of understand what the plan of the company was so a whole bunch more got tossed out and then you know there was five seven ten of them that eventually i i was focusing on and of them about i want to say four or five did make it into the white tundra portfolio here in may and june obviously low liquidity, low volume. So it takes a little bit longer to, to get in, which is probably a good thing because I had time to, to make sure my thesis was correct, uh, talk to investors in those companies, make sure I wasn't missing anything. Um, just given that a lot of these junior companies don't have slide decks, they don't have the latest financials, they don't have information as freely available. They may not even have an investor relations team to begin with, but you know, I thought it was it was maybe a good time to to share some of some of what I saw of what I'm doing with these companies, what I'm looking at, um, especially when when there is no information available. How do we get this information? How do we make um, judgments, interpretations, and investment decisions based on kind of half information? And um, the way I kind of thought about this is, if I can discuss two companies that I did end up buying. And then two companies that I did not buy, kind of share why I did and why I didn't. It would be a better way to go about things than to just discuss the the positive aspects of of everything. So, yeah. Before I begin, a couple of notes up front. I'm not an investment advisor. Uh, everything I share today is my opinion. is is based on my research, my interpretation. Uh, please do your own due diligence. Please check your own risk tolerance and your portfolio construction. Uh, the way you are going to do your investments may differ significantly from the way I look at it and the way I construct my portfolio. Um, so, so just keep that in mind. These companies are highly speculative. Some of them rely on one or two or three or four well results that are going to drive the valuation here. And uh, on top of that, being junior companies, a lot of people don't even know about these companies. So unless they have a plan in place that you can figure out of how you're going to get that share price appreciation. Are you going to get special dividends? Are you going to get some sort of buyback? How is that value going to come back to you as opposed to just being wasted or thrown in the ground on other projects or whatnot? And then the timeline. A lot of junior companies have a different timeline for their production growth, their return to shareholders, et cetera, than, um, than some of the bigger companies. So just a lot of other things to keep in mind, a lot of due diligence required with these companies, not just go and buy them as, as YOLO plays or, or whatnot. Um, so there's that. The other thing, I do have a mailing list now ongoing. So if you would like invites to these events, uh, the Zoom links and, and the files and everything, uh, please email me, shoot me a DM. I can get you on the list. And they're just the emails before the events. I am running a bit behind on those. so. If you have messaged me and I haven't uh, got to it yet, I apologize, but I will I will get to that here in the next next week or so. Um, both the Twitter space and the Zoom call is recorded. 
for anyone on the Twitter space that joined a little bit later and you want to join for the visuals, the Zoom link is on the website. So whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events. And there's a Zoom link there. You can follow along, ask questions. I will only be taking questions on the Zoom, um, just given that the audio screws up with the recording if I take questions on the on the Twitter space. But other than that, going to keep it pretty short here, keep it simple. Um, what I'm going to share today is not all the research I, I did on these companies. It's the best, the best, most material I can get into a concise uh, presentation. So there's a lot more that goes into it, but these are kind of the main points that, that make a difference as to whether they're worth looking into or not, kind of right off the bat. So four companies today, uh, Prairie Provident, Prospera, two that made it into my portfolio. And then we'll be discussing Vital Energy and Brychem, uh, one ENP and one service company that, that did not make it in. And I'll kind of discuss why. Um, and you know, that, that may not be reason for you to invest or not invest. You know, you, you might find something in this presentation that speaks to you uh, differently. So yeah, we'll get started here. So the first one, um, Prairie Provident Resources. This is a kind of the larger company in this group that we'll be talking about today, about $150 million enterprise value. So a few things to look at right off the bat. With a company of this size, you wanna look at the, the production and the production mix. So a company making 4,000 BOEs, if it's 90% oil versus 10% oil, is a huge difference to the way the company should be valued. I see a lot of people using flowing BOE uh, calculations and saying, oh, this company should be valued at 40,000 per flowing BOE, but they don't take into account that the company was only 30% oil or 40% oil. So you can't just take numbers and try to allocate it across the industry without looking at the, the percentages. So with Prairie Provident, about 4,200 BOEs, we have 65% liquids. So that would include your, your oils, heavy oil, light oil, condensate, and natural gas. So keep that in mind. Uh, you also want to look at reserves. Again, a lot of companies are reporting reserves in MMBOE. You want to go into it. Like as an investor, we want to look at are those mostly gas reserves? Are those mostly oil reserves? Whenever something is in BOE, I have to look into it further and try and separate the oil from the gas, um, which we'll get into here. The reserve life index is 19 years. So They've got a pretty decent inventory here of, of 2P reserve that they can use to maintain their production. A 15% decline rate on PDP, which is pretty much industry leading. Um, you know, definitely very, very important, especially with some of these junior companies that are talking about growth. If they have a huge PDP decline rate, as in their legacy production itself is declining at a huge rate, it's gonna take a lot more dollars to just maintain current production, and then you're adding growth on top of that. So with junior companies that want to grow, I always look at the PDP decline rate. If it's anything over 25, 27%, you wanna be careful here that there's gonna to be too much money going into these sorts of projects to, to not really get that much production growth at the end of the day. 15%, uh, very, very good. I was quite comfortable with this when I made my investment decision here. And the tax pools. This is something that, that really sets Prairie Provident apart, I think, in, in the junior oil and gas space. They've got $860 million of tax pools. So, you know, tax on a, people use different numbers. They, they use 5% valuation, they use 7% of it. But when we take it as a, as a real number, the tax rate in Canada, let's say is 20 to 25%, somewhere in there on profits. 863 million of tax pool is worth roughly $175 million using that metric, which is more than the EV. It's almost six times the market capitalization. So this was something that got brought up here. I had a meeting with, um, with a fund manager about a week ago and, and he said, you keep comparing things to enterprise value, but it's really the market cap that you're buying. You're not buying the debt of the company, you're buying shares, which is the market capitalization. So as the company pays back debt, the, 
the market cap is going to rise to reflect that debt pay down and everything should be compared to market cap. Now, how you do things, how I do things is going to differ. I still look at EV and I'm also now looking at market cap and how things are a factor or a, a uh, ratio to market cap capitalization. Um, and these sort of tax pools, you won't find this sort of ratio in any other company. Um, Meg Energy, for example, one of, the, one of the ones that gets brought up a lot for their heavy tax pool that they have. So they've got 7 billion of tax pool, take 20% of that, it's 1.4 billion on a market cap of roughly, uh, call it 5 billion. So it's 30% of the market cap. What we're seeing here, the tax pool is 600% of market cap. So there's a magnitude of difference here that you can find in some of these junior companies, uh, which, which just doesn't, wouldn't make sense for a company of a bigger size to have. And uh, what they do with these tax pools, again, you may say, well, it's not really important because they're not gonna generate this much cash for, for many, many years, so it doesn't matter. But there's other ways that tax pools can be monetized. And I don't wanna to go too much into it, but there are ways you can sell strictly tax pool along with other uh, assets thrown in there and monetize this uh, right away. So yeah, that's kind of the basic info. Again, a very, very highly leveraged company, $30 million market cap for a 130 million net debt. <clears throat> the debt to equity may scare some people. And this, this company was trading as low as I think five cents or even lower when the COVID crash came. So definitely one that, that not, a, not a lot of people believed in, but as things go on, I've talked about this before, in a rising slash high commodity price environment, I'm on the lookout for very highly debt leveraged companies where you have a lot of financial leverage. <clears throat> as long as the thesis plays out, which if I didn't believe in the thesis playing out, I wouldn't be spending all this time or investing money anyway. But if the thesis plays out and continues to play out, companies like this, I am specifically targeting um, as kind of that, that heavy torque instead of buying options or instead of buying margined equities. Um, okay, so on the financial side, one of the big things I look at is as, as the prices have come up, as the commodity prices are rising, how much of that has the company been able to realize? So we look at this for Q3 2021, the realized price per BOE was $56 a BOE. And the operating net back before hedging was $24, okay? So 56 and 24. In Q4, the prices went up roughly $6 a BOE and they got roughly five, $5.2 increase in operating net back. So they were able to realize roughly, call it 85% of the increase in pricing. That is really, really good. That's what you wanna see. You don't wanna see companies where as the commodity price goes up, the, they're, they're wasting it on royalties and operating costs and, and capital and, well, not really capital here, but uh, other costs that take away from your operating net back. In this case, looking pretty good. When we look at Q1 2022, the, the operating net or the realized price went up again, $16 a BOE, and it resulted in roughly a $13 increase in operating net back. Again, between 80 and 90%, really, really good. That's where I would expect a lot of the, the good companies to be in that sort of range where they can, they can get 80 to 90% of the increase in price going directly to the operating net back. You will see companies that, that fail at this because their operating cost goes through the roof. Their royalties go really, really high. They have other issues with um, site reliability or their realized pricing is not very good because they're suffering from dislocation in pricing in the area that they operate in. So keep all these things in mind. I think it's very, very important on junior companies, especially I don't trust any of them. I don't trust any of these management to properly run these companies. And that's, that's how I always go into junior companies as a, as a skeptic. 
and try and figure out are they actually making money not what they say they're making but but behind the scenes you know a dollar here a dollar there getting lost uh ends up adding up big time so one of the ways i start off is this way reserves reserves are getting very very important i'm finding more and more people talking about you know they don't care about cash flow they care about reserves and they want to know what does the company have there's been some big acquisitions here in the last couple of weeks that maybe the market didn't really like but they were more reserve focused so you know we look at a company like like Perry provident again so you know 414 million dollar of 2p reserve uh, at year end 2021 pricing which is roughly a 72 dollar wti um, strip so at a 72 dollar wti strip the 2p reserve is about 414 million dollars you take debt out of that we end up at a roughly dollar 50 a share of 2p reserve at 70 dollar um, strip pricing when we take it to 90 dollars your 2p reserve goes to four dollars 32 32 cents a share at a hundred dollar flat wti we get more than five dollars of 2p value even even just one p value is over three dollars a share so as an investor and keep in mind this is after subtracting debt this is after accounting for the for the debt part of it so as an investor when i'm looking at this i see a share price at 20 to 25 cents that you know even at 90 dollar wti let's call it the 1p reserve is worth 10 times what the stock is trading at so is that going to be right away that the stock is going to 10x no by no means is that going to happen there's no remote possibility of that but as things go on as as the bull market materializes as people are more confident with the strip pricing with the structural supply problem here they're more comfortable buying energy stocks a lot of we see a lot of chatter around oil oil getting taken off the the esg you know do not invest list as the money flows in companies with the biggest dislocation between current price and the net asset value price or the free cash flow price are the ones that i really want to target that i want to look at further and spend a little more time um, just just doing more research on them so looks good from a um, net back perspective looks good from a net asset value perspective what's the problem why why is this company not getting the value that maybe it should hedging again i've discussed this previously front running companies where the hedges are dropping off so if we look at if we look at prairie provident what's going on about 4000 boes 65% oil and liquids so call it 60% oil they have roughly 2400 barrels of oil production 1250 of that so more than half is hedged at a max of $64 a barrel WTI. Looks really bad. In hindsight, you know, this is not a good hedge at all. They also have puts on uh, 300 barrels. So this is just a put, so it doesn't apply. They're not going to sell it um, at this price. But the point stands that more than half the production of oil is at $64 a barrel. Going into 2023, it's very interesting what they've done. They've only bought put spreads. They they've down they have the downside protection to forty dollars a barrel, but they haven't capped the upside. So this may not mean much on a big company, but on a small company, when you have more than fifty percent of your production, that's going to go from getting sixty four dollars a barrel to let's say a hundred dollars a barrel. That makes a huge difference. To the cash flow and the free cash flow, the derivative loss is basically taken out. They basically have no hedges for 2023 other than the second half, uh, where they have 500 barrels hedged at $105 a barrel. So, not really that bad. 105, I think we can take that. But for Q1, Q2, 2023, the entire 
oil production is unhedged. And as a company that's growing production, you get more and more unhedged barrels coming online as we get to that January 1st, 2023. So a little early to be investing, some would say, you, you know, we're still six months out. We are um, still two quarters out from these hedges rolling off. But to explain my investment kind of thesis was that if I can grab a bunch of shares now and, and the value disconnect is so large, it's a 10x difference on a net asset value calculation. You know, if I can buy shares now, I'll buy them and kind of hold on to them and wait for the cycle to go on. Um, if the cycle something changes, if there's a massive uh, recession of some sort where, where global oil demand falls way more than it ever has, I, I still have the downside protection on the hedges and the company is basically valued at blowdown value anyway. So that's just the way that I think of it. Again, this is not investment advice. You will have to do your own due diligence and make your own kind of thesis on it. But this was enough. I had a meeting with uh, Tony, the new CEO, went through a lot of this stuff and uh, cleared up my doubts. And uh, you know, it ended up being one that, that ended up in my portfolio. So optimization, again, something that I really focus on these days is there's a lot of assets that were productive in 2010 to 2014, very, very good assets with very good oil rates that just did not get the love they needed from 2015 to 2021. As soon as the well went down, basically they said, nope, we're not gonna fix it. This is too high of a work over cost. We're just gonna leave it. Coming back to 2022 now, at these sorts of pricings, these workovers are low hanging fruit. A lot of them have already been activated, but there's companies that, that are behind, that are almost a year behind because they just didn't have the cash. They had debt issues in 2020. They had debt issues in 2021. Finally now, they're able to properly capitalize these assets. So, um, you know, PPR, Prairie Provident is doing work in the provost field, Southern Alberta, which is near the US border, and then doing some, some water flood work. Very, very good capital efficiencies on these sorts of projects. So because the wells are already drilled, the water injectors are already there, the pipelines are already there, the well site equipment is already being installed. You know, they have spare capacity on the processing equipment, the batteries. It takes very little money to get these, this production online. And the bonus on that is a lot of this production comes online at much higher rates than when it was shut in. When you shut a well in for six, seven, eight years, the pressure in the reservoir builds up, the oil kind of builds up any water channeling, water coning issues that were happening get fixed, alleviated to some extent, and you get what we call flush production for the first um, you know, week, month. It, it all kind of depends on the well and what they're doing. But um, the main point is, I like when companies are doing this. When they show this, there's, there's quite a few companies actually that are talking about these reactivation programs the problem being a lot of them have already reactivated a lot of their wells. So 2020, 2021, and Q1, 22, they have already reactivated a bunch of their wells. There's only a few companies left that are still working on kind of getting back this lost production. Um, really, really enjoy this. I, I enjoyed my conversation with Tony on this, on the specific fields and what they're doing there, uh, given his experience working in the field or, or being heavily involved in the field. And from an engineering standpoint, I think a lot of what he's saying makes, makes sense um, from my experience working in, in adjacent fields here. So to give an example of that, one of the things they've done is in the, in the band, band formation in the Michichi area, basically the older wells were, were drilled this way as you see in this visual here, they were trying to target both this top zone and the bottom zone and try and kind of um, 
get exposure to both the zones in the same time. And that was good. It made sense because if you can access two zones for the price of one, why not? But the problem was they weren't actually getting to the meat of the zone, which is the bottom BAF zone, the lower BAF, which is a much higher porosity. There's much more oil there to target. So what the team has done here, they're now optimizing the placement of this well to be more on the bottom. And they've left out this uh, detrital, I think, a zone up top. They said, you know what, this is not as productive. We're gonna leave this. We're gonna go fully in the lower BAF. And you see kind of what's happened here. The rates are up about 10 to 20%. And most importantly, your ultimate recovery is up almost 30% on the oil. Um, why is it important? Because as, as things go on, this leads to a lower decline rate, a better production. And if they can find a way to make the water flooding work, you get even higher rates further and further you go. You're spending less money on capital to keep production flat. Small changes, but over the long term and over multiple wells add up almost like a compounding effect on them as things go, um, go on. So uh, not, not too much more I wanna share on this, but uh, just an example of what they're doing kind of on the engineering side. They have a brand new management team that came in in 2020 and 2021. They have a brand new field operations staff. They have a brand new field leadership team. They, they're actively targeting ways that they can make, make more oil, make more gas and make more money. And again, with some of these junior companies, I really like to see this because there is a tendency in junior companies to have status quo that, okay, you know, things are running as they are. Why bother doing too much out of the norm um, and taking risks? That's how a lot of junior companies function. But to see Prairie Provident go out and try and make changes and actually achieve these changes, they've drilled two wells in this, in this uh, lower bath and both have actually come on at, at this higher rate that they projected, um, you know, speaks, speaks to somebody willing to take risk and educated risk where the, where the risk reward is so skewed in their favor that they might as well do it uh, kind of thing. Um, so again, I talked about work over wells, wells you can fix up. Look at the amount of wells that Prairie Provident has. They have over 4,000 wells uh, all across Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan. Some people see this and they freak out. They say, oh, this is a huge liability. We don't, we don't wanna deal with companies like this. I see this and I see dollar bills. I see bags of cash. I see wells that were not economic at $60 oil. They were not economic at $70 oil. But at $100 oil, they're absolutely crazy cash flow on these and payback periods of like four days or five days. And to explain that a little bit more is that let's say you have a well that requires $65 to operate. It's a very high operating cost well, and it goes down. So if the price of oil is $70, you're only making $5 a barrel on it. It may not be worth it. The, the economics don't make sense to fix these wells. But if the price of oil now goes to $80 a barrel, you know, the price of oil has only gone up 15% from 70 to 80, but your margin has gone from $5 to $15 a barrel. It's, it's 3X. So I think it's important to look at ARO liabilities, suspended wells with this sort of mindset is we can't compare them to a $0 oil price environment. We, we have to say, how much does the net, net back go up or the operating margin go up um, as the price oil increases? And when I look at it from that lens, I would bet that a lot of these suspended wells here or ones that need workovers or one that, ones that need pump changes are extremely economic at $100 oil or 90 or even $80 oil. Um, so watching very closely how, how these things kind of go, but I am noticing a lot of companies talking about, we have shut in fields, we have work over wells, we have optimizations we can do, which shows me that they're, they now realize this, that, hey, you know, some of these wells, yeah, they've been shut in for a while. Yeah, they weren't economic. Now, I think, it's time to take a second look at them. 
And uh, that's music to my ears because a lot of these fields, if you talk to the people working in these fields, people who worked in them 10, 15, 20 years ago, they can point out wells that used to be prolific and 2014 hit, 2015 hit, the well went down because of whatever reason and it never got fired up. Then the production engineer changed in the company and the management changed or the company got bought out and all this information was kind of lost in that transition. But now they're taking a second look at it six or seven years down the road. Great. Um, these are the two Michichi wells I talked about. You can see they're coming on at about 150, 175 uh, barrels a day. The green line is oil, uh, plus you have the gas in red. So a lot of gas production and oil. This is the second Michichi well. Uh, again, came on at roughly 150 barrels a day, pretty decent well. Um, you know, when we look at the old Michichi wells, so the one using the old technology targeting both the reservoirs, we see they came on at only 100 barrels a day and they, they declined pretty strongly, you know, about a 90% decline in, uh, call it three and a half years, four years. So it'll be interesting to watch the new wells. Yeah, they came on stronger. We already know that. But what is the decline rate going to be? How are they going to produce as things go on? And uh, it, it will definitely be interesting to watch because if this way works out, um, Prairie Provident has a huge inventory of undrilled Michichi locations that if they can apply this new uh, technique to it, not only do they get better production, they get better efficiencies, they get more dollar per BOE, they get uh, lower decline rates possibly, and they get more net asset value. They get more value for reserve, reserves in the ground if they can prove out this technique by year end 2022. Um, so that's on the Banff wells. Talking about the Glock wells, the Princess Glockenite, pretty interesting formation. Look at the way the reservoirs are. They're like little river channels, uh, very unique uh, compared to the way people think of most oil fields or, or oil assets. Um, this is the 3 29 well that they drilled last year. And, you know, look at, look at how the well's producing. It's, it's actually producing really, really good. The type curve, it should have been down to about 200 barrels by now, and it's still producing over 400 barrels. And these wells are very, very economic. It's about two million, two to $3 million, somewhere in there, uh, to drill complete and equip these wells. And for it to be making six months down the road, still making 400, sorry, this is BOEs, still making 400 BOEs, um, you know, pretty, good payout and if it doesn't decline you will make that money on and on and on compared to the unconventional wells which once they decline they just start declining and you can't get the production back um, the second thing i want to mention here is the again on the engineering side what they're doing the company could have just said you know what we'll just produce this well as is and keep it going which is how i believe the previous glock wells were produced, but with this one, they've installed artificial lift. And then as the production started declining, they went in and put a bigger bottom hole pump. Um, this is good production engineering. This is good field operations. When you see production decline and you're managing a asset, a production of, of oil, a field, and I see companies coming up with ideas to get production back, and they successfully execute on it, what else can I really ask for, right? This is really, really good work and they're very transparent with it. They're actually giving us the production in real time um, as the corporate presentations are updated, which is very, very rare in the industry. Um, you, you have to rely on Petroninja, Geoscout, these sorts of things to try and figure out what's happening. But um, Prairie Provident is confident enough to put it out there and uh, um, uh, show you what's going on as things go. A um, couple other points on this. So they are drilling two more Glock wells. So there's one right here, I believe. And I don't know where the other one is, but 
these wells are not going to be as good as this well. So the reason being that if I look at the production history of this channel versus the, this channel, this channel is way more productive. And I'm almost hoping that they can find a way to get these sections of land right here and this and this uh, to, to drill more wells in this area, which is definitely the better channel of the two. And you know, once again, little differences that maybe may not matter if on a big company, they're like, oh, whatever, you know, this is fine. But the productivity of this reservoir is significantly lower than this channel right here. Um, and for a company that's only drilling one or two wells in this area per year, which channel they're drilling in makes a massive difference in my opinion. And uh, definitely one that I'm watching, keeping in touch with the management team that are they gonna drill more in this channel instead? Are they able to buy this land? Um, because I know the wells are, are gonna be way better. Um, I believe this is the older Glock wells that I have here. Yeah, so these are the older Princess Glockenite wells. We see how they decline. So in about a two year period, again, it's declined roughly 90%. We need to compare this to the new well. Whatever they have done to make changes here that they're outperforming type curve, are they gonna be able to sustain that? Why is that important? Because if they can sustain that on one well, on two, on three, on five wells, that tells me there's been a inflection point in the productivity of the entire field. And we can, we can use the new type curves going forward. Again, better production, better capital efficiencies, lower declines possibly, and more reserve value at the end of the year, all benefits. Um, slave point, so not too familiar with this asset. I've never really worked in this, in this area, but there are a couple companies active. I believe Surge, I wanna say Surge is active in this area as well. Old school water flood. We see the well spacing is way more, the distance between the wells. And it's a, it's a water flood pilot that they're doing. They've, they've done some water flooding work here. If they can convert these, these, these uh, producers to injectors, they're gonna drill a couple of new wells. They're gonna change up the water flooding scheme see how things go. And this is one area where the reserves really matter because they don't have that many water injectors right now. And when you run a water flooding scheme, you can two to three X the recovery factor of these fields. And the issue with the way reserves are calculated is if Prairie Provident is doing water flood in one section here of the field, and they prove it out, the regulator only gives them, the regulator or the, or the reserves evaluator only gives them credit for water flooding in that section. It doesn't really make sense that the way they do it, but that's the way they do it. They deal the cards, we play the game. So if Prairie Provident can prove out that the water flooding works in two or three or four other sections here, which is what they're doing this year, and into 2023, I will have a lot of confidence that even though they're only getting reserve um, benefit for these sections, I would probably be 99% plus confident that the water flooding would work across this entire field. And you see this field, there's a lot of sections that are undrilled, a lot of sections with extra infill space in them and uh, where they can expand the field, great. Why? Because they don't have to go out and acquire land. They don't have to go out and make acquisitions. They can just prove out the water flood, expand the field, do a few drills, grow it out without needing to go um, and buy a tapped out field. And I hate talking about uh, or just ripping on companies, but if you look at a map of what Saturn Oil just bought from, from a Crescent Point, in the Viking and you overlay it or put it on the side of a map like this, you will see what I'm trying to say. That field is completely tapped out. There's no place to drill. There's no place to really do any increased recovery. 
it's just producing the field into decline, into oblivion. Whereas when I look at fields like this, I see a lot of upside from the water flooding, from the enhanced recovery, from infill drilling, field expansion, uh, producer conversion, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll put that in a future seminar on our, or on a Twitter um, post here, comparing this with the other one and exactly visualize what I'm trying to say. So a few other things on the financial side to watch for, GNA expenses. This is your general and administrative expenses, also known as basically money that they use for, for things that they can't really explain. Um, so your office rent, your stampede parties, all that goes in here. So, you know, not bad. It's up roughly 25% year over year. Not great. Uh, definitely watch, watch this. Make sure this doesn't get out of hand and goes through the roof as prices go higher. Uh, there's a tendency of oil and gas companies to enjoy some of the profits, if you will. Um, so definitely watching this. It has gone up not significant enough that it's a concern, but watching every quarter. Um, finance cost. So the way that PPR is set up with the debt being so much higher than the market cap, they're paying a lot in interest. How much are they paying? They're paying $16 million a year in interest on a market cap of today, roughly call it 25, $30 million. So if we look at just market cap, they're paying 60% of that in interest cost. As that, as that debt is gonna be paid down, especially with the hedges rolling off next year, this interest cost is gonna be completely gone or, or much lower. With highly debted companies, this is a big positive to your cash flow going forward. The way I look at this is even if they reduce half of this, right? Let's say, let's say by year end or, or mid 2023, they find a way to reduce half this cost it's roughly $8 million a year. Just saving that can pay a 33% dividend on the equity. So when I run these numbers and I look at this and I look at the net asset value, I see a absolutely disgusting uh, mis misvaluation here, which at today's price may make sense. At today's hedging, at today's finance cost and whatnot may make sense, but when I look at companies, I look at six, 12, 18 you know, months down the road, where are they going to be assuming this price on WTI, assuming this production, and what should the company be valued at on those dates? Um, so keep that in mind, interest cost on small companies is absolutely killer, but it's bullish or a positive if they can pay it off as they go and that, that money goes from interest cost to free cash flow. Mm. Couple other things here, Prudential being their main banker might scare a lot of people because Prudential is a very predatory lender. They will find any way to, to gouge the company's uh, takeover assets, uh, get extremely high interest rates, uh, fees and fines and whatnot. And this was clarified to me by somebody else is that Prudential has two branches. There's a kind of like a commercial branch and then there's the junior company branch. And the commercial branch, which supports the big, big funds, the big companies is the one that's a predatory uh, of the two. The Prudential that is talking to Prairie Provident is, is the junior company side of things and are much more supportive. They're much more helpful. They try and make sure the company is gonna keep going. They're not out there like vultures looking to seize assets. And something that is not really obvious, unless you talk to people who are involved um, directly with these lenders, ATB as well, a pretty supportive lender. I don't think they have too much with ATB, but it's in there either way. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that there is, when you're looking at the, the banks, the banks supporting some of these companies, I think it's very, very important because it, it's directly related 
related to the insolvency risk that you're taking on. Um, at $100 oil, I wouldn't be worried about it anyway, but we wanna stress test these things to lower WTI. And the last thing I want is companies to go under because they didn't meet one of the criteria of the, of the line of credit, something like that. We want supportive lenders, which some of the other companies I've talked about also have, and I believe PPR also has, maybe not to the same extent, but um, getting there. Um, okay, the other thing I wanna talk about was the ARO. Again, how people see ARO, I think is changing rapidly. It's also very polarizing. So we look at the, the undiscounted liability is about 244 million. It's more than the entire enterprise value. Uh, and it's about eight times the market cap. You know, some people are gonna freak out and they say, no, nope, I don't wanna deal with all this ARO. It's just too much, too much debt that after the Redwater decision <clears throat> got put in as a, a first lien debt, not worth dealing with. When I see this in a hundred dollar oil price environment with a management team that's actively working over wells, that's trying to find every extra barrel they can. This to me, again, screams dollar bills. It screams money bags. Is liability is a liability because it was not, it was not um, economic at the pricing that they've calculated it at. So at seventy dollar WTI, it was a liability. At hundred dollar WTI, this is a well that's already been drilled that's already produced, it's already got casing, it's already got pipelines, already got production equipment. People already know the history of this well, how to fix it, how to produce it, and, I'm, and I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to take any risk on drilling, on completions, on work over. You know, it's, it's a simple cookie cutter work over. Sounds like an asset to me. So again, I'm not saying everyone needs to look at it this way, this is how I look at it, is some of these liabilities that are this many millions of dollars actually may end up being assets. To, to put a number on it is very hard, like how much percent of it is an asset. But, you know, Prairie Provident is actively shutting in or restarting fields that have been shut in for seven to eight to 10 years. They directly go from a liability to an asset right away. And it's not reflected in this because reserves are only calculated once a year. So we won't know what the difference is until December of 2022 or when the reserves for, for 2022 are released. Um, the other point I wanna make here is people using ARO as debt and putting it like right away today, it's due today. This is due over the next 55 years. So, you take 240 million and you put it due today versus due over the next 55 years, it's a difference between night and day. So I don't wanna tell people how to think about ARO. I'm sharing how I think about ARO. 240 million over 55 years is roughly four to $5 million a year. And some of it is gonna convert it, is, is going to be converted to an asset. Sounds like a win-win to me, not, not really anything to be super, overly concerned about. The ARO is not gonna be the thing that takes a company bankrupt with, with, with this sort of way um, of looking at it, especially because the AER is supporting this with the site work programs and the funding and the grants and whatnot. The, the actual cost may end up being even less as things go on. Um, okay, well, I've got a lot on PPR. Um, okay, so couple things here again, they, they are very close to their borrowing facility limit. Um, and it also goes down by $4 million US at the end of this year. So th this is probably one of the biggest risks with PPR is any changes made to the borrowing revolving facility. The debt markets for, for term debt have opened up a lot. Um, especially in the small to mid cap space in oil, but it's not, it, it doesn't seem to quite be there for a company of this size quite yet. So 
there is a bit of risk here on, on the revolving facility, but if the commodity markets are going to be strong um, and they're not hedged into 2023, there's a bit of a cushion there. Again, please do your own risk tolerance check and whether you're comfortable with something like this. Um, there's also 34 million warrants. So there's 34 million share warrants that have an exercise price of two cents a share. Um, it's a pretty significant dilution. It's about a 25% dilution with these warrants. It's a two cents a share. So basically the company is gonna get no money from this. Um, I'm pretty sure the company is trying to find ways to, to get rid of these or to accelerate the exercise of them. My, the way that I look at this is it, it's not really a big concern because the market cap is so low compared to the value of the company to begin with that it doesn't make a significant difference to the EV. Yeah, the market cap goes up 25%, but the enterprise value only goes up 3%, 2 to 3%. So for now, it's not a big deal. Um, here's where they talk about their reactivations. So they reactivated one of the wells in their Coots field, which is right by the border crossing into the States, uh, came on at 60 barrels of initial production and it stabilized at 18 barrels a day. They had only budgeted this to add five BOEs per day. They're getting 18. They got 60 for a week, two weeks, a month. It's already paid for the work over many, many times. Um, I can almost guarantee that. And they're doing more reactivations in the loyal, loyalist field, which is uh, by Hader near Provost. Um, so, you know, optimizations in the non-core portfolio. Love to see it. Um, operating cost, keep this in mind. Inflation is a way bigger deal for smaller companies than it is for bigger companies. So your big companies are gonna tell you you know, we're only affected, we're only affected by inflation 10%, 15%. Whereas we see here the operating cost for PPR is going up roughly 25, 30%. So inflation will always affect the smaller companies more. So if you're running calculations, you're doing sensitivity analysis, um, the inflation baked in needs to be a lot larger. For, uh, for smaller companies. And um, that's why I discussed earlier, watch as the commodity prices go up, how much of that are they able to get or are they using it up in higher royalties and higher operating costs and end up getting no benefit to higher pricing. Big changes. So two of the board of directors got kicked out in May, in late May. And the chair of the board only got 75% votes in the most recent AGM, along with one of the other directors also only getting 75%. So definitely big changes at the company. Some of these board of directors that got kicked out have been there since 2011. Um, some people might say it's a good thing. They, they know the company, they know what's going on. I almost think it, it, it becomes a negative at some point because you get the same people trying to control the same company and not really doing a good job of it. The, you know, not, not doing the right things for the assets, not capitalizing properly. Uh, the whole status quo mentality just comes in where, oh, we'll just let things run as they're being running, why change it? Um, but but I, I like seeing that the two new board members, including Tony, the new CEO, got 97% of the votes. So people are, are obviously looking for change here. And um, so far, it seems like seems like things are going well. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but um, I do want to mention that this area is of a special importance to me because this is where the multilateral wells are starting up. We saw Surge do it. We see Westlake and Westcan in this area, and look at how much land Pro uh, Prairie Provident has in this area. Potentially, they're waiting to see how other companies drill their multilaterals, and then they go in on their land and uh, do the same thing. Conversations with management seem to indicate that, that they're willing to wait and see how the results come out. 
um, and then kind of possibly do a development plan on these assets um, uh, going forward. Um, so there's a question here, is PPR still 4% of your portfolio? Um, yeah, so I, I have made absolutely no moves in the last three weeks-ish. So whatever's on the website, all I did was, um, I believe I added, I added Crew Energy. I don't think it's on the, on the portfolio yet, but that's, that's really the only change. I will update the portfolio here uh, this weekend for the, the latest version, I guess. Um, the next ones are a lot shorter, so I hope to kind of go through these a little bit faster. Um, it always ends up running so long. Um, I did want to say for anyone on the Twitter space that, that is maybe a bit confused, you want to join for the visuals, the Zoom link is on the website, whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom under events. Uh, there's a Zoom link, and you can see the PowerPoint as we go on. Um, may, may help a little bit compared to the audio. Uh, but uh, either way, um, so there's a question here on if oil drops to sixty to seventy dollars on recession concerns, how long can they survive? Um, I don't think very long. Uh, they they do have the hedging in place, but I would give them a year or less at those sorts of pricing. Uh, I obviously don't believe that because if I believed, if I if I thought that oil was going to go to these prices, I would have sold everything today. Um, I would not even have hesitated, but I, I just don't see that happening. Um, yeah, especially with the way Russia has been acting with with maintaining price. But I'll save that for a different uh, different session. Um, Prospera, so a company that basically no one knew about until maybe a couple of months ago when they put out a corporate update as to what was going on. So this company was basically bankrupt. In 2020, they were not paying their debts. They were not paying the staff. They were not paying anyone really. And uh, they brought in a new management team. They raised about $8 million and they paid back all the debt that they owed, uh, $7.1 million to the landowners, the municipalities, the city, et cetera. Um, there was 400 AER non-compliances that they fixed up. They did maintenance on the facility and the pipeline um, to fix up corrosion issues and all this. Uh, and they brought production from like 50 barrels a day to 600, uh, about a 12X increase in production. Um, and, and they ended up buying out their working partners in the core properties to go from 40% ownership to 80%. So now they have become the operator, they control the decisions, they control the property, which is pretty important uh, going forward but what are they telling us they have they have three properties uh that are the main ones very very heavy oil 12 to 17 percent ap or 12 to 17 api it's along the alberta saskatchewan border um cuthbert hart hills looseland and uh basically they, they've done a lot of things here and it's it's a very complicated company it's very hard to understand what they're doing in real time because there's so much going on. One of the companies that doesn't have a corporate presentation. So you're basically going through news articles and CDAR reports, MDNAs to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, what really matters is this right here. They have fields with extremely high original oil in place that has only been targeted with vertical wells. I've talked about this before. There's a lot of fields that in 2014, 2013, could only be targeted by vertical drilling. Now, since the advent of horizontal drilling, shale, fracking, all this, we have a lot better horizontal geo-steering technology. So we're able to drill horizontally, access way more of the reservoir, and get way better production rates from these wells. And um, let me see if I have it here. Uh, yeah, so I don't have it here. But, but basically, what makes Prospera especially interesting to me and why I bought in is because their reservoir in these three fields, in at least two of them, 
is only two to three meters thick. And it's a very, very heavy oil. Now, just picture us putting vertical holes into a two meter thick reservoir with very heavy oil. And think about how much of the reservoir you're accessing. You're, all, you're only accessing that piece where the vertical well goes and heavy oil only flows so far. Even with really good porosity, really good permeability, heavy oil, just the viscosity of it, can only flow so far. Now let's picture a horizontal well going through three meters of pay for a kilometer, two, three kilometers long. The entire time it's in that pay, you're accessing the number that I have, you're accessing 200 times the reservoir using horizontal drilling. The wells don't cost that much. They're only 600 meters deep, six to 700 meters deep, cheap wells. You can go in there, do these horizontal drills. Um, with a vertical drilling program, the previous operator had, was producing up to 10,000 barrels a day. Right now, the three fields are only producing 600 barrels a day, and they were accessing way less of the reservoir with the vertical drilling. So when I look at this company, it's more of a story play. It's like, okay, there's been a shift in technology and we're gonna use this technology in these fields with a lot of oil in place, almost half a billion barrels, uh, not really accurate. It's, it's about 375 million barrels. Only 8% has been recovered. When we look at fields, similar fields that have applied horizontal technology, the recoveries, even before any water flood or, or any recovery scheme, are upwards of 20%, 20 to 25%. So let's do some quick math. That's about 17% extra on 375 million barrels. It gives us roughly, let's say, 60 million barrels of extra recovery. And you know, let's go conservative of the conservative, $10 per barrel in the ground. $600 million, that would put Prospera at roughly a 15 to 20 X, if not more. And I love stories like this with skewed risk reward. And then we get this little tidbit that they just reported yesterday. Completed horizontal drilling program in Q2 that demonstrates commercial viability of the existing reservoir. The summer fall drilling program is expected to increase production to 1500 barrels per day. So they're gonna drill only two, three, four wells at a million dollars each, let's say, million and a half. It's gonna cost them five to $6 million. They increase production by a thousand barrels a day with a very, very low decline. So which company can you buy that's a thousand barrels a day that costs $5 million with a low decline? Uh, the, the answer is none. Um, and, and this was just reported yesterday, like I said, they have demonstrated the commercial viability of this reservoir. They, what they're saying is a horizontal drilling has worked to their expectation or higher. Um, and now it's just about drilling. Now it's just about expanding the field and doing these horizontal drills and making money. So um, skewed risk reward, um, small companies. Like I said, I looked at over 75 of these, 50 to 75-ish, somewhere in there. I wanna say higher than 75 junior companies and there's only a few that, that end up giving me the risk reward that I was looking for. Um, as well as reserves, you know, right now, think about drilling a bunch of vertical wells, how much of the reservoir you access and how much reserves you're gonna get credit for. Now drill one horizontal, you access 200 times the reservoir, what kind of reserves can they get year end 2022? And, and the valuation that's gonna bring back to the share price. Um, again, I wanna highlight this. This is not investment advice. I'm sharing my research, my opinion, what I see, why I invested in these companies. Uh, please, with junior companies, it is absolutely important to do due diligence. There's a lot of things that can be missed, that can be misrepresented, that can be interpreted incorrectly that somebody else might have a different view on it. Um, so definitely watch for that. A Couple other, 
other things here. The Richardson family out of Manitoba was involved in the capital raise here. And for those that don't know, the Richardson family has been exceptionally successful with the uh, Tundra oil and gas out of Manitoba. They have grown this company. They have found really, really good fields that they can grow using EOR techniques, using drilling. They're not targeting the big, sexy Montney Duvernay plays. They're targeting these conventional light slash heavy oil reservoirs. And to have their support in a company like this, um, you know, gives, just gives it that much more credibility that somebody is looking at where this could end up um, as they grow. The second thing is shared dilution. When you look at this company on TMX or on your TD Bank or, or Yahoo Finance, the share count is not really correct. The shares outstanding are roughly 140 million shares, but the dilution, there's a lot of dilution built in that brings the share count to about 350, 400 million shares, almost 3X. Why does that not concern me? Because the share dilution is gonna happen anywhere between six and a half cents to eight cents. So if I'm buying the shares today, any share dilution that's gonna occur is going to be at a higher price than what I paid. And even though the shares are getting diluted, it gives the company money to then go and accelerate their development program and pay off debt and you know, just have better metrics, et cetera. So Prairie Provident, I don't like the share dilution because it's at two cents. I could never buy shares at two cents. Prospera, I don't mind the share dilution because it's anywhere between 10 to 40% above what I'm paying today at six cents or six and a half cents, um, which is where the company trades at today. Um, so doesn't doesn't really bother me. It, it does take away from the upside. Obviously, if shares keep getting diluted at these lower levels, um, however, it's still at a decent enough price that it doesn't really bother me. Um, as long as there's not too much more of it coming down the line. Um, so I went back to 1983. I looked at some of the wells in 1983, and you will find this very often where when they give you a range that, oh, our heavy oil is between 12 to 17 API, most likely most of their production is at the lower end of the range. So I went back to their original well and look at the API that came out 12.4 at the lower end of the range. Why is it important? Because 12 API oil will get a discount compared to 17 API oil. You know, it's not much, maybe two, three dollars a barrel, but it's enough that I think it's important to keep in mind. It also gives you a, an understanding of the way the company is reporting things. If they're always reporting things at the lower end of the range and they put this high end, it gives you a way to look at other things that they're reporting. Um, you know, let's say they report their production budget. They say, oh, we're gonna, we, we're planning to produce between X and Y BOEs per day. And I see all this information pointing that they're usually at the lower end of the range. I can assume the lower end of the range for any other thing um, that they're putting out. The other thing I wanted to verify was that this was, th this was in actual a two meter thick zone. And we see that here. The oldest, some of the oldest vertical wells, the ones that produce the most in actuality were perforated only in a two meter zone. Um, very, very strange. You don't usually see vertical wells in this sort of zone make this much oil, um, but they have. And why is that good? Because if they can go in horizontally, stay in this zone the whole time, access 200 times the reservoir, yeah, it's definitely, definitely gets me excited as a, as a field guy or a petroleum engineer. There's definitely a lot of uh, upside I see here if things, if things do work out. Uh, here's the oil pictures. I, I went back and looked at some of the, um, these are not core samples, but they're the actual drilling returns. You see the oil, oil splashing, splotching kind of all over the place. Very high porosity. Um, I see Rock Creek was on, was on the Zoom, so uh, you'll be happy to hear. This is three to five Darcy permeability. Very, very rare. You don't find these sorts of permeabilities 
and porosities um, in a lot of reservoirs. It's, it's extremely permeable. The oil does flow and in a horizontal well, that's where it ends up making a lot of difference because you're basically in the entire reservoir, a, a two meter thick zone and you have a you know, casing and tubing going through it. You're accessing just about the whole, the whole reservoir um, at that point. This is a little bit deeper. You see the amount of oil that's staining these rocks. Uh, it, it's a very, very porous, permeable reservoir, which is usually, when you have high porosity is when you have high original oil in place, um, just the way the, the calculation works. Um, the formula, I should say. Um, so we see the three fields here. Uh, that I talked about one, two, and three. Two and three are kind of side by side, and we see how much how much oil they've made, and and a lot of these wells ha have been shut in for fifteen to twenty years. So, um, if you're telling me I can drill a well for one point five million dollars of vertical, back in the day, probably way cheaper, and it can produce over half a million barrels in a 10 year period, uh, we can drill the same well today horizontally, access way more of the reservoir, but even if it only produces half a million barrels times a net back of 70, $80, let's say, that's $40 million you're making off a of vertical well. Horizontal, we don't even know how, how much oil this can produce. Um, again, skewed risk reward. When, when the valuation is so far off base from, a, from an engineering standpoint, you know, there's, I don't think people are, are looking at things this way. They're not looking at the engineering side and the upside um, of companies like this. But um, you know, I, this is where I used to work. My field was uh, right here, just North Macklin, you know, not, not that far from here. And uh, I've talked about the Macklin field before and how I just can't wait until we have horizontal drilling, multilateral drilling, et cetera, come to these fields because they are high original oil in place fields. When you drill vertically, the oil just does not want to flow, but horizontally, it's a game changer. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to, to see the next Prospera news release, the horizontal drill that they did, what kind of rates did it come on at? Uh, I might have to send, send some spies in the area to count trucks and whatnot, uh, but looking forward to data is how I'm gonna put it. Um, one of the issues here is operating cost. They have no pipelines in the area. It's all single well batteries. So when you have pipelines to 40, 60, 80 wells, they all flow in the pipeline and they all go to one, one battery where it's processed. Very simple, very cheap. When you have single well batteries, you're having to send trucks to each individual tank, pick up the oil, which takes about an hour, hour and a half to load oil, come back to the main battery, unload the oil, which again takes an hour, hour and a half. And these trucks charge anywhere between $175 to $250 an hour. They carry roughly 250 barrels. So, you know, you're you're definitely adding on four, five, seven dollars a barrel of operating cost. Plus, you have to maintain these tanks, uh, fix them up. You got to do your checks. There's a lot of problems with, with running a system this way, but I think it's run this way because the oil is too heavy to flow in a pipeline. At 12 API, you're you're really pushing uh, the the limits of how far you can pump oil in a pipeline flow line. Um, but anyway, the point I'm trying to make is the operating cost is going to be definitely higher than any comparable with a flow line system. Um, this is the same picture with pipelines. We see not, not too much for pipeline. This is the main battery right here. Uh, we see it's connected by pipeline to probably some sort of sales terminal, but um, the wells themselves have no pipeline back to the main, main battery. Um, these are some of the vertical wells. So, you know, even the vertical wells were coming on at three, 400 barrels a day. And the declines, not, not that bad, actually. When you think about it, this is a 10 year 
you know, 20 year chart here, the declines are, are not that bad on these vertical wells. Why? Because there's so much oil down there that it just keeps producing at the same rate, um, even on a vertical well. Um, runtime looks pretty good. Uh, this is another one. This is another vertical well. So you see that they're restarting some of these old wells. Again, optimization. So it's not just the new drilling that's an upside here. It's the restart and optimization of the old wells that were shut in in 2008, you know, 2010, whatever, doesn't really matter, that are now being brought back on. You know, they only produce 10, 15, 20 barrels a day, but they don't decline. And it's very cheap to bring them back onto production. The, everything's already there. So, you know, I like to track these wells that, that, that come on. What rate do they come on at? And what's the decline rate on them this many years down the road? Um, another one, this one is actually pretty interesting because it, it actually totally died just recently in about 2017. And they haven't brought it back on yet, but you know, I track this well. I'm, I'm seeing every month, are they gonna bring this back on? Which wells are they bringing back on? These wells making 10 to 20, 30 barrels a day, really solid wells. The, you know, it, it may seem strange to put it this way, but my field that I operated in, in Macklin, I had over hundred wells. My best well made 15 to 20 barrels a day. That's how these fields are. They, they don't produce these massive numbers. They produce 10, 15, 20 barrels a day. And they produce at that rate pretty much forever, which is great. You know, you have these old wells, then you drill new wells that, that are your production growth, but you have your base production with an almost 0% decline rate, um, right? Um, so this is what I think has happened with this well. It died in 2017. Look at the closest water injector. Up till about 2017, it was still injecting at pretty high rates. And then it just, something screwed up. Uh, this asset was also transferred in 2018, I believe. 2018 or 2016, somewhere in there. The new operator screwed up on the, the water injection volumes. They let the water injection die, which caused a corresponding drop in the, in the oil production um, of the surrounding wells. Water flooding is not something you can mess around with. You, you have to keep it going at the same rates that it's used to. So how hard is it to restart water injection at higher levels? Not, not that hard, um, not that hard. If you got the right amount of you know, people looking at the problem, it's not that hard to solve and get the water injection back on and get some of these wells back on producing at these sorts of rates for very, very cheap, especially if you're doing a bunch of them and one injector was going to five wells, all you gotta do is fire up one injector and you get upwards of hundred barrels of production um, from the five wells combined um, coming online. Um, okay, so a couple more things here on Prospera. Operating cost, $47 a barrel. It's gonna go down, right? As, as more wells come online, you don't need any more operators. You don't need any more equipment. You already have the batteries. Everything's already built. As the production goes up, the operating cost comes down, which goes directly into my operating net back. So this is a company that I expect as they drill more wells, I'm expecting this net back to go up more than the change in commodity pricing because the operating cost should be coming down significantly. Same with the interest and GNA chart. Per barrel, it just seems extreme right now that they're spending $10 a barrel or a BOE on GNA. That's because their production is so low. As the production goes up, it makes less and less of an impact per BOE. Um, this is the same for a lot of the companies I've talked about in the past that are of this size um, or bigger that are doing these, these workovers and production increase activities. Um, and one that I, I don't often see people talk about, they always complain about, oh, this company made no money in Q3. Oh, this company made no money in Q4. It's absolute junk. But they don't take into account that the reason they made no money is because any small company 
the interest and the office expense and the, the company trucks and the operating cost are going to be way higher on a per BOE compared to when they double their production. Um, so that the net back itself and the funds flow has a torque factor built into it just because of this, which the bigger companies don't have. Um, if people don't want to give it value, you know, be, be my guest, I'll, I'll buy the shares. And then when things do, when production does double or triple, um, you know, we'll let the market be the, be the teller of, of what's actually happening. Um, but yeah, I, I really love companies like this where the operating cost is so high, the GNA is so high um, because they're setting up for this ramp up in production phase. Uh, and, and I get every single dollar of operating cost reduction comes back to me as a funds flow uh, compared to other companies. Actually, the next one I'll talk about, uh, we will we'll show this point pretty clearly why I did not buy that company. Um, again, quick math. We talked about this before, but the you know, 390 million barrels in place, 30 million recovered, even a 1% increase in recovery factor, about 4 million barrels, $40 million if you give it $10 per barrel underground. Um, the entire EV of the company today, including the diluted shares, is roughly somewhere between 25 and 35 million. So for every 1% increase, the price that I bought the shares at, it doubles. And this is not new technology. Horizontal drilling has been going on for a while. Um, heavy oil drilling has been going on for a while. We have uh, recovery factor increases from horizontal drilling going on for a while. You know, th this is not something that is brand new, you know, that, that this 1% increase has a lot of risk associated with it. I, I don't really think so. Um, ARO, again, the company has $23 million of ARO. So what? These are wells that have been shut in in the last three, four years, the last 10 years that they're now gonna bring back online. So it's gonna leave ARO and go into an active uh, producing asset. And if I have ARO on an active well, as opposed to a suspended well, I can kick the can down the road. I make money off the producing well and the, and the discount on the ARO gets higher and higher because of inflation. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Prospera very hard to figure out what's going on. They don't have a corporate presentation. Management is relatively difficult to get a hold of. Don't know what's going on with their development plans, the new well. Um, but with the risk reward where it was, I, I just had to, had to buy these, uh, this company, um, especially given my love for multilateral wells and horizontal drilling and work over, workovers on old fields where the equipment's already there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you go back, you know, to my portfolio and look at the companies I've been adding, a lot of them are similar in a way to that thesis. Uh, the next one, vital energy. Um, so there's a question here. Are you working on a price target for PEI? Um, not, not really, no. These small companies, it's so hard to get price targets on because the way the price targets are calculated are based on the current cash flow or the last quarter cash flow, which would be completely wrong um, metric to use for a company like this. But I am thinking about launching kind of a separate price targets sheet that's going to show the upside um, that I'm seeing. However, that has got me, I think, a little bit worried because. I do see possibly people just buying companies without doing due diligence. Um, so still thinking about that one. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the question. Um, third company. So now we'll, we'll talk about two companies that did not end up making it into my portfolio. And I'll kind of discuss why um, to, to some extent. So the first one is Vital Energy Oil, uh, VUX on the TSX Venture. Pretty interesting, interesting little company. Um, about five to 600 barrels a day, BOEs per day. But here's the first problem. They've got 600 BOEs per day and they've got 10, 11 assets. 
uh, just way too scattered. There's way too much going on here. Uh, hard to really figure out which asset is good, which asset is bad, where the money's going. This company does not have a corporate presentation. They've got an asset overview presentation, but no corporate presentation. Um, the other problem is the management, I don't even know where they are. They, it's a Chinese owned company. The management, I think still lives in China. You can't get a hold of them through email, phone, uh, fax, nothing. They, they're basically impossible to get a hold of. First problem. Um, however, their, their assets are actually really good. So this is Lampman, Southeast Saskatchewan, Frobisher Wells. Uh, I've talked about Surge and their Southeast Saskatchewan being so good, payouts of 25 to 40 days on the new wells. Um, Vital Oil just drilled three of them last year and, you know, pretty, pretty good wells. Um, you know, came on at 300 barrels a day, produced that for a couple months, and then they started declining pretty heavily and concerning the the decline rates on these wells are actually very very high these frobisher wells um so yeah they made their money back but their core production just has this massive decline built into it which i'm just not a fan of you know what i want my core production to be low decline so that any new wells i drill end up increasing production here we have the opposite happening where the core wells have this massive decline built in. So it's like a treadmill effect where the new wells that they drill are just keeping production flat, let not really increasing production. Um, here's the other one, the other one they drilled. Same thing, came on at three, 400 barrels a day. In six months, it's down to 100, 125. So that's a massive decline to be taking on your core production. Uh, here's the third one, actually. This one completely died. It, it went from 250 barrels a day. In six months, it's down to 30, 35. Uh, this, yeah, these are all vital wells. The, the, three that, the three new ones that they drilled, these three here. Um, you kind of got to wonder what's going on with this well. Are, are they almost at the fringe of the zone, at the, at the edge of the zone? where they're not really getting good. They get the good production up front, but the reservoir dies very quickly. Um, and you know, the, the seven of four well would be this one here. So it's the furthest away from like these other Frobisher wells. Um, so definitely watching this month by month, tracking these. Um, Gull Lake, this is the, the second asset they have. A bunch of old vertical wells, 50-50 uh, partnership with Taku Gas. These are operated by Vital, I believe. These up here are operated by Taku. Um, th these are wells I actually like. You know, it was it was producing producing 90 barrels a day in 2019. It's producing 80 barrels a day today. Yeah, that's a good core asset. That's the assets you want as your base production. Um, it's too bad they're only 50% in these because it would be nice. For more of the production to be this sort of um, field. But also the Gull Lake wells are very weird. Some of them don't decline like this one. And some of them suffer massive decline where it's declined 90% in two years. So hard to figure out the new, the new wells. I think they have plans to drill two new wells. Um, I believe, yeah, two horizontals. So one right here, one right here. Uh, it's hard for me to figure out what production is going to come on at and what the decline rate is going to be, given this jarring difference between two wells that are basically side by side. One doesn't decline. One has a 90% decline in two years. Um, more wells in this area. So, you know, another one that actually hasn't declined, the rate's actually gone up. So it went from making 80 barrels a day in 2016 to now making 100 barrels a day in 2022. So hard to explain from a reservoir slash production engineering standpoint, what's going on here. It's almost impossible. And meanwhile, the gas rate also keeps going up. Uh, so they're making more production. 
but I can't get a hold of management to figure out, you know, what the issue is. Um, another one where the production has gone up. So, you know, pretty interesting things happening here from a geologic uh, standpoint. Um, name of this asset. So Sullivan Lake, third one. The, this is a um, BAMF horizontal development. Why this is interesting is because this is right next to Prairie Providence and their BAMF development. So if Vital was smart, they would follow Prairie Providence results using the new drilling technique, 60% in, in the lower BAMF versus 100% in the, in the lower BAMF. And they would use that same technology here to drill better wells. Will they end up doing that? We will find out. And I also don't know because I can't get a hold of management uh, um, through, through any method, really. Um, Sullivan Lake Wells, you know, not, not that great. Compared to Prairie Providence, these are absolute junk. But if they can use a new technique, fix up their drilling, uh, they, they might actually be able to produce at these 125 rates that uh, Prairie Providence is drilling. Um, just other assets. I, I don't even know what the name, names of these ones are, but you know, they've got way too many assets making 15 to 20 barrels a day. N not really good because there's no expansion possibility. You know, there's only limited upside here and they're only producing 15 to 20 barrels a day. So you have to take care of this whole asset. Your engineering team is busy with it. Your geologic team is busy with it. Your, uh, corrosion team, your admin team is busy with all these assets that make 15 to 20 barrels a day. Uh, not really the way that I would be looking at an investment idea um, and be happy with it. So where's the growth? The growth, Monty. Vital Oil is now saying, look, we're happy with these other fields. We're gonna go in the Monty now and drill these Monty wells. They bought these four, four areas. Uh, they've got about 20 locations that they figured out and they're right next to arc resources the original arc resources not not the seven gen stuff but the original arc anti creek uh, development just just south of grand prairie east southeast of grand prairie um, it's a good sign it's a good sign that there's adjacent wells which are all of these here put it a different way our arc resources wells and this is the vital oil land again the four sections and how how are the arc resources wells well very very different so this one came on at 75 barrels a day stayed there for about two years you can see they're very recent drills so arc has been capitalizing this asset recently again a good sign for an adjacent land um, but Montney Wells coming on at 75 barrels a day, not, not good. Then you have a second well right next to the other one that came on at 750 barrels a day. Um, and yeah, it declined, but all, all Montney Wells declined. And uh, now it's at 75 barrels a day, two years later, just like the other one. But the point of the matter is in unconventional wells, your payout, the payout getting your money back is always upfront. So when this well, fizzled out and it didn't make the 700 barrels up front, this well probably never even paid out to what they put in. Whereas this well paid out in a couple of months, you know, three, four, five months, and the rest is gravy. How are the new vital wells gonna be? Again, it's so difficult to tell because you have wells that li literally side by side came on at 10 times the production of each other. So just way too much uncertainty built in here. Uh, we have. They also have a cardium play that they're targeting. This is Eclipse Resources next to Eclipse. Uh, this is high tech Tyne has this long well here. Um, they bought just this small section and the wells aren't even that long compared to what, what the industry is drilling these days. So are they gonna be good wells? I honestly don't think so. I don't think this is gonna be that, that good. Um, these cardiums are not that good to begin with. They only come on at 80, 90 barrels a day for a two, two and a half million dollar well, 
maybe cheaper with with these ones um but but they're not that good they don't give you the production growth and the runway and the upside that i'm looking for from a from company that's producing six seven hundred barrels a day um yeah this is another cardium here kind of one of the newest ones it did produce 100 barrels a day but still not not that great um more in the southeast saskatchewan they bought some more land in southeast saskatchewan next to surge um you know pretty decent wells come on at 500 barrels a day decline to 50 in two years not bad um uh, what's this gainsborough bought some more land here they bought some more land in hume but <laughs> the main point is they don't have any acreage anywhere they can actually grow or sustain or produce. They've got random sections all over the place with two wells here and four wells there and six wells there um, next to assets that we don't know the productive capacity of. And there was just too much uncertainty for me to take a position. I did, I did actually trade Vital um, April. I bought a block and was able to sell it at a higher price. Um, but for long-term investment, I just don't see the production stability here. There's too much uncertainty. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. Now, if they come out and they drill four Montney wells that come on at 750 barrels a day, you know, I'm here looking stupid. But the risk-reward skew is just not interesting enough for me. Um, and I did a lot of work on Vital. I, I looked at every single well. I looked at every single asset to try and figure out, is there something in here that's a hidden gem that I'm not noticing. Um, and they're all decent assets, nothing that's really, really good, um, in my opinion. Um, the other thing, I don't see the upside on the uh, production cost. Their production cost is only $12 a barrel, even for Q1 2022. And even for having so many assets and being such a small company, this is absolutely tremendous work. Like I have to commend their work here to keep production costs to $12 a barrel or a BOE with all these assets and all these things to manage uh, is, is really quite, quite amazing. Um, to me, it's a negative. Why? Because I don't get any extra money. When something has a high operating cost, as the production grows, I get the benefit of a lower production operating cost, more net back more cash flow to me when the operating cost is already twelve dollars a barrel there's not much for me to get there in fact this cost is likely to go up as they drill montneys as they drill cardiums new fields so i'm actually losing money as they're growing production um, and they don't have decommissioning liabilities um, which again strange as it may sound i like companies with a little bit of a higher decommissioning liability which means they have wells to work over, they have wells to restart um, at very, very good capital efficiencies. But for, for someone looking for a very safe play with low debt, I think they have no debt right now, um, low liabilities, you know, decent enough assets could be something that, that might be worth looking into. Uh, this is the biggest problem I have here. There is one individual that owns roughly 60% of the shares outstanding, 60 to 65% of the shares outstanding. I don't know who he is, he or she is. I don't know what they do. I don't know their history. Um, I believe this individual was involved in the oil industry for quite a while, uh, but you know, I can't just pick up the phone and call them and say, look, what are you doing with your 65% ownership? What's your plan here, right? I, I don't have that transparency and it just added to issues where I just was not comfortable investing in something where one person owns 62% of the shares. And I don't know the company's development plans. I don't know if the company's looking to sell. I don't know if the company's looking to drill. Unknown, too much unknown and uncertainty, um, unfortunately, in what could be a really, really solid company that's been drilling really good wells over the last couple of years. Yeah, so that's Vital Oil. Um, bit of a safer play, in my opinion, something that has too much uncertainty around it. And I just was not comfortable at, at, at the pricing that it was getting at. It was, 
it was trading at roughly 40 to 50,000 a flowing barrel um, already. So didn't give me the upside. If it was trading at one third of, of what it was at, would I have maybe taken a chance on the Montney drills? Possibly. Um, but there's just too many people that know about this company that are following it pretty religiously and uh, have brought the price up to where one could say it's almost fairly valued um, at this point. Again, just my opinion. So last company, Brychem Corporation. I wanted to put a service company in here. I was getting a lot of questions about service companies and what's going on. Why are you not buying them? You know, they're going to make all this cash and people are drilling, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there was never any numbers associated with it. It was always uh, anecdotes and uh, narratives. So I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a company that's related directly to drilling and figure out what's actually going on here. Not, not the big companies that you know, people already know about, but a smaller company. I picked Barcam because they sell drilling fluids. That's their core business. And if you're going to be telling me that drilling activity is going to increase, uh, people are going to spend more on drilling, why not look at a company that gives out drilling fluids? one-to-one -one correlation. Um, so the first thing I, I looked at is where are they? Okay, so within Canada, they're in the Bakken, Viking, the East Ubernay, Cardium, Montney, Northeast BC. They basically got everything covered. Great. Let's look at the US, Bakken, Neobrara, not, not too much in the Utica, Marcellus, um, not too much in Oklahoma but they've got some in the Canna Woodford, uh, in the Eagleford. But most striking to me is they have nothing in the Permian. They have absolutely nothing in the Permian. All they have is one uh, facility near the Eagleford and the rest is all Eastern Texas. Um, so you may, you may be able to think of this two ways. One, they have no exposure. So if they get in there, they can make more money. Or the other way, which is the way I looked at it, is the Permian has a lot of long-term contracts. There's relationships that have been built for many, many years, for decades, for a new participant to now go in there and try and uh, take over market share is gonna be extremely tough. Where is the most drilling occurring today? The most rigs are in the Permian. The most growth you could say in rigs could be in the Permian and the company has nothing in the Permian. A, a big negative right off the bat. Uh, I think this is page one in their corporate presentation. Uh, so, you know, something to, to think about with service companies, which basins are they in and are, are they able to maintain or grow market share in those basins? Where is the activity going on? Where are the rigs being expanded? Um, all these things I think are important before we even look at a service companies financials or money or margins or anything like that. Um, so let's go to money. They made about $18 million of revenue in, this is revenue, yep, um, in Canada, or sorry, in, in fluids distribution and 23 and a half million sales across the company, all their assets. The entire company's enterprise value is only about 15 to $16 million. So a company worth $15 million has revenue of almost 25 million in one quarter. Definitely got me interested. I said, okay, well, that's, that's actually pretty interesting. They're making seven times their EV in revenue every year, 15 million of EV, 100 million of revenue per year. No, pretty interesting scenario here. Um, this is also interesting the, the growth for this company, even though it's a TSX listed company, the growth came from the U S the Canadian fluids was only up about 40% call it the U S fluids was up three X more than three X. So if I was to buy Brychem, I would actually go and look at where in the U S did they actually increase their revenues. Do they have a monopoly in certain fields that are now just getting capitalized? You know, something in Oklahoma, something in Colorado, 
I don't know because I didn't end up buying it, but things to look at. Where is the revenue growing? Which, um, which line of the product is the revenue growing in? Look at this, within fluids blending, Canada doubled, US went down 30%. So you almost gotta wonder what's going on. Their fluids distribution went up 3X in a year, but the fluids blending and packaging went down 20%. Questions that come up need to be explained. If someone is looking to invest in this company or is pitching this company to me, I think it's important to, to explain these things, why, why there's all these deviations. Um, salaries and benefits. They went up 6X in a year. They went up from 300,000 in Q1 2021 to 1.6 million in Q1 2022. Why? So a big reason for this, I looked into this, was because of the Canadian wage subsidy that got um, that was active last year, where the government was paying for a lot of small businesses employees. And the other thing was that they added a bunch of employees in the last year. They went from about 40 employees to 60 employees. Again, why? What was the reasoning for it? Maybe just because the, the company was growing, but definitely watch this on service companies. Um, you don't want this getting out of hand, the salaries and benefits section, and it does get out of hand um, at certain times. SGNA as well, look for the total selling general admin cost. If it's going through the roof, something is a concern here. It's pretty even. Uh, this selling, I watch very closely because selling tells you how many lunches and dinners and flights did the sales team take. And they've actually been very, very good. They, they've only spent $56,000. Uh, they spent 68,000 last year. But if this starts getting out of hand, again, that tells you there's a culture problem within the company where they're spending too much on, on, on selling as in golf tournaments and gifts and boating trips and whatnot. Um, for those that work in the industry, you know what, what happens, right? Like as prices go up, as commodities go up, as people make money, a lot of that, some, some of that also goes to uh, parties and whatnot, which is fine, uh, but definitely want to keep an eye out. Margins. I was sent Q1 results uh, by an individual, very, very smart individual. And you know that the Q1 was absolutely crazy. The stock went up 40% or something in a day when the Q1 result came out. Um, but, but there's some issues here that I think behind the scenes should be discussed. So the first one, Q1 is always the most active rig count season. Q1 and Q4, especially in Canada, are usually the most active. Um, it didn't really materialize in 2021 because the whole industry was growing as a whole. But in general, with service companies who are in Canada, Q1 is always gonna show higher sales than the rest of the year. And a lot of people don't, don't take these things into account. They just say, oh, it's gonna be the same activity. When, look at the Canadian rig count for the last 20 years, there's always a huge bump in Q1, a slowdown in Q2, Q3, and then Q4 ramp up um, again. So watch for that with service companies. The second thing to watch for is the gross margin that they reported is higher than a lot of the previous years by a significant margin. They're saying they got a 25% gross margin in Q1. Q4 was 20. Uh, going back into 2020, it was 14 to 16%. So can they maintain this 25% margin on their, um, on their business? I don't believe so. And I'll show you exactly why. If we go back to 2013 and 2012, which were kind of the boom years in Canadian slash US oil, uh, drilling fluids, Brycam was a way bigger company, almost double, and their margins were still lower. It was 16, you know, between 14 and 16 percent. So the fact that they got 25 percent, I think, is more an outlier than something to take going forward. Look at 2019, pre-COVID, the margin was 16 to 17 percent. How did they all of a sudden get 25 percent? Um, 
and and are they going to sustain it is is the main question that stopped me from investing in this company because i don't think they can sustain it in fact i think the margin is going to go even lower than 16% um and i'll talk about it here in a sec uh slide of the wrong page um so the reason being is if i go here the way that a lot of service companies operate is they have a huge accounts receivable and they have a massive inventory that they keep especially for chemical companies like brycam so what i think has happened is the drilling fluid they sold in q1 they had actually bought in sometime in 2021 and they kept it as inventory a lot of drilling fluid the components of it are oil and gas oil and gas was a lot cheaper in 2021 so they bought inventory at 2021 oil rates blended up the chemicals and they sold it at 2022 oil um, sales rates the uh, product rates so it's kind of like a one-time adjustment where they got cheap inventory and they sold it at higher oil pricing rates. And that's why their gross margin went so far high. As the year goes on, that cheap inventory is gonna be gone. More and more of it is gonna be consumed. There's gonna be less and less. They're gonna buy at current oil rates and have to sell at current oil rates. So the margin is already gonna get compressed with this. But the second issue is the service companies, I think, are suffering from other cost inflation. So not just the price of oil, but we know this in training, getting labor, the maintenance on their pumping equipment, uh, paying their, la their labor on site, paying their labor in the distribution areas. So there's a double whammy coming to the gross margin of Brycam. One, from their cheap inventory leaving, and two, from just service side inflation, internal inflation that they may or may not be able to pass on. We don't know. Um, so. Just because of these uncertainties, I basically avoided the company to begin with, but there are a few positives I wanna talk about. So they, they redid their loan agreement uh, about a month ago, two months ago, which is gonna save them around a million dollars a year. Uh, so pretty significant for a company that's only worth 15 million to save a million dollars a year of, of interest, pretty significant. Um, and, and, and one that also came with a share price boost when this news came out. Um, to do, what was I gonna discuss here? So, not, not really too much to, to discuss here, just I think compared to ENPs, I look at the financials of service companies more because there's always other stuff built in, cost of sales, the salaries, SGNA, compare them year to year, what's going on. Um, this, especially the cost of sales, we saw that sales have roughly doubled and the cost of sales has, has doubled. But if the ratio starts getting out of whack, it might show you a trend as to what's going to happen going forward. Are they going to make more money or less money? Um, that's really all I want to talk about here. The financing cost, you can see, pretty significant for a company of this size. Um, They've got this income tax recovery, which I'm still trying to figure out what exactly this means. Um, but, you know, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, the current assets, I talked about this. A lot of service companies have inventories and accounts receivable that are opposite to what their debt is. So when I first looked at this company, I said, oh, my God, they got $38 million of debt. They got bank debt. They got accounts payable. They got the long-term debt you know, the, the EV should be way higher. But no, when you look at their assets, they have about $24 million that companies who use their product still have to pay them. It's essentially cash. Same with inventories, it's basically cash. They've got $45 million of cash that counteract the debt. So they have basically zero debt. Um, I don't take property and equipment into account um, you you can or you can't, but but history has shown companies like Trican, Step, and whatnot, they trade at 10 to 20 cents per dollar of book value of property. So for us to take this as a dollar to dollar value, 
not not really accurate, I don't think. Um, so I just left this out and they still are debt free. Uh, the other thing, unpaid, unpaid debts. Service companies always be careful to what they're reporting. So December 31st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. It's only been three months. But in those three months, the number of outstanding invoices that they have to collect on that are more than four months delayed went from 2.7 million to 4.6 million. Concerning, definitely concerning. 60 days is normal payment terms in the oil industry. If you're a CNRL or a tourmaline, you might get 90 days, but over 120 days means there's some sort of concern with the ENP that they sold these drilling fluids to. And the fact that the, the number over 120 is accelerating, it's becoming a larger percentage of the total accounts receivable, not a good sign. They already have 600,000 roughly of doubtful accounts that they already feel they may not be able to get back. That is also rising. It went from 436,000 to 563,000 in just one quarter. And you know, 150,000 here and there may not be a big deal. You might say, ah, oh, whatever, this is fine. They're still making money, but it's a trend. The trend is a problem, especially when there's four and a half million dollars at stake possibly on this accounts receivable. Um, I never got a chance to talk to management. I kind of let this thing go before I got too deep into the research. Um, but, but definitely one, if, if we are ever able to get management on a Twitter space or on a one-on-one, -on -one, I will ask them what's going on here. And very curious to see Q2 results and whether this number goes up even further. And that's it. Uh, like I said, I didn't really spend too much time on Brycam because there was, there was too many red flags right up front. I'm not saying they're not making money right now. I just think that money that they're making is going to deteriorate uh, pretty ma materially going forward. Um, the share price doesn't agree with my thesis, but that's what makes market. So yeah, so I'll kind of end it there. Um, you know, the, these are only four of the companies that I've looked at, I've looked at many, many of them. Um, and very, very few make it into the portfolio at the end of the day. Uh, so I did want to talk about the two that did, and then these two that didn't. Um, and I'd love to hear more feedback on this, on these sorts of sessions, uh, given kind of they're a little bit different, a little bit more detailed. I don't know how much of my viewership really wants to go this deep into these companies, uh, but I love sharing them because there's, there's always things I notice looking at these companies, looking at the assets that I'm like, you know what? These are interesting things that should be looked at industry-wide. So these things like bad debts, you know, I, I never hear anyone talking about how much bad debt does Tricam have? How much bad debt does essential energy have that's overdue that they may never recover? How are the margins changing quarter to quarter? Do they have cheap inventory that they're selling at inflated prices today, but they're not gonna be able to anymore? You know, all, all these little things I think make way more difference um, than people think. Uh, so yeah, so I'll kind of end it there. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, there's a couple of questions here. So uh, is crew energy still a holding in your portfolio? Yeah, so I do still have crew energy percentage. I want to say somewhere around five to six percent right now is is where it would be. I haven't run the numbers. I'm going to update the portfolio today, today or tomorrow on the website. Uh, but yeah, roughly five to six percent, I'd say somewhere in there. Um, yeah, and that's that. Uh, thanks everyone once again for attending. Uh, the recording will be on YouTube here shortly. And uh, we will see you all, I think next week I got Whitecap, Crescent Point, and another company coming up. So we'll do a little revaluation on that. I've done a deeper dive on the XTO asset that they bought, that Whitecap bought. Uh, gonna kind of go through that in detail, what I see, what I don't see, where the issues are. Um, 
so I look forward to sharing sharing more on that. And um, yeah, we'll just keep on keeping on. And uh, once again, appreciate everyone attending, and uh, we'll catch you at the next one.